right, welcome everyone to another episode of Dave Cooper Live, where we bring you the people, the products, and the process, helping us all build it better. And if you haven't noticed, we have a couple of themes here on our show. Industrialized construction, productization, building science, housing affordability, safety, health, and wellness. Collaboration between associations and industries. Well, today we hit on almost every topic as we discuss the architect's role redefine. Please welcome today Peter Demaria, whose award-winning work has been published, exhibited, televised, internationally even. He is CEO and co-founder of Steelbox and today reveals big plans for Midrise Modular and how he and his team are addressing homelessness with a people-centric modular solution. However, before we bring you all of these innovative conversations, we have to thank all of our sponsors because without them, we cannot bring you all of these wonderful people showing us how we can build it better. So let's take a moment and thank all of our sponsors. Stream Modular, the only logistics company you need to transport your mods, pods, and panels. Our friends at Stream Modular are investing $50 million over the next 25 years to build the technology, solutions, and trailers needed to handle and transport the projects of today and meet the demands of tomorrow. Reach out to their team at Stream Modular com to discuss your next project. CombiLift is the largest global manufacturer of multi-directional forklifts and straddle carriers. A leader in long load handling solutions offering a free warehouse and site optimization design service. CombiLift helps companies of all sizes and from every industry maximize the capacity, safety, and efficiency of their warehouse and storage facilities. A big thank you to Paul Short and the team at CombiLift for helping us all to build it better. Visit them at CombiLift.com. Brave Control Solutions, where offsite manufacturing systems that do more than just improve productivity. They have a unique approach to industrialized construction, a lineup of flexible automation systems specifically designed for the construction industry and powered by CAD 2Fab and turnkey solutions for 3D volumetric assembly, structural insulated panels, finished wall assemblies, MEP component processing, assembly, kitting, and storage. Learn more at thinkbrave.com. All right, a big thank you to all of our sponsors. All right, well, without further ado, Peter DiMaria is going to join us right now, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. Peter, how are you, sir? I'm doing great this morning, Dave. Thanks for having me. Yeah, super, super excited to have you on the show. I'm really looking forward to today's presentation. You're going to run through some slides with us. We're going to learn a little bit about your background. We're going to learn about what you're doing now. We're going to learn about these mid-rise modular buildings, all of the fun stuff. But first, we want to know everything about you, Peter, from the moment you were born to this very moment in time. Do not leave out any of the good stuff from the hospital, or I'm going to bring your son on the show, and that could rather get embarrassing for you. But you only have two minutes to do it, so go ahead. The floor is yours. All right, great. Um, kind of backed into the modular space, working as a creative architect back around 2004, 2005, and created what, from what I understand, is the first uh, cargo container based project in the United States. Uh, all because it was such a challenge with conventional construction, too expensive, and all those fun things. And, and that need, that problem led to a creative response. Uh, and, and we haven't stopped since. We've gone from the container world into the modular world and started out in single family, uh, but now we're moving on to multifamily. It's just, just the spectrum has blown wide open for us, which is really nice. So our timing has been great. Um, prior to that first you know, and significant project, uh, went to art school, attended the University of Texas at Austin, I went to the School of Architecture there, um, met some incredible people, uh, really opened, my, you know, opened the world to me uh, in, in terms of what was possible uh, as an architect. Uh, but even before then, grew up in New Jersey, um, right alongside all those cargo containers and um, learned a whole bunch about construction, living in an Italian-American neighborhood where you know 75% of the men there were all contractors or, or all builders. So 
is part of our part of our DNA. And uh, now I find myself in uh, in Austin and in Los Angeles, and uh, onto some really really creative and, and, and larger things. So. I think that that's the two minute version. I, I, I could go on forever. And I don't want to bore the audience. Uh, you're not going to you're not boring anybody. Right. I mean, everybody's history kind of forms what their future is doing and where you're headed with everything. So um, where are you at today? Just curious. You in California? Yes. I'm in Los Angeles today. Uh, I split my time. Uh, typically three quarters of the time I'm in L.A. And then I'm in Austin. I was teaching at the University of Texas. Uh, for about three years and then we have some yeah. incredible opportunities here in terms of modular and uh, so came back to LA and been commuting back and forth ever since. Uh, LA is really on the forefront and, and I'm happy to be here and part of that community. Well you know you helped drive the forefront of this if we go back and look at it. Can you just give us a brief background on how this whole container project came together because that's really what you you started with right you had a passion to do this to help with the homelessness and affordability how, how did that project actually come to fruition well, uh, a few different things happened uh, when we first started out working on the modular uh, excuse me working on the container-based project in redondo beach in 2005 Looks like we lost Peter there. Let's see if he comes back in here. Give him a second. Are you there, Peter? Yeah. Wait one second. Let me finish the page. There you go. go. Yeah, I'm still here, but uh, I'm not okay. sure if um, you still have me. Yep. Go ahead. Just okay. keep talking. So, yep. So what, what happened was we were we were solving one problem, but I think what happened is we, we went ahead and, and solved a few other problems. And we started to see that the affordability, the speed, the efficiency, and all of those things in theory – could actually work, so we um, we went ahead with that, and uh, and and it kind of blossomed. And it's that you know the, the solutions to this one problem can now be applied to a, a wider and wider spectrum. And eventually, got involved with folks who wanted to to take the modular idea to another level. I could not do it alone. I mean, it was just too right. small of an operation. Uh, got involved with a company called HBG and a gentleman named Max Azria, who was pretty famous in the fashion world and said, listen, I want to do what you're doing, but we want to do it on steroids. And we want to do it at a, at a level where we can do some multifamily work uh, and, and, and help people, give everyone a home on the planet. That, that was the yes. message. And uh, I spent about three years back and forth in Shanghai and China, and all of that culminated in an 84 unit apartment building in Los Angeles. Yeah. And th those modules are made out of modified containers. In other words, when I got to China, they let me create my own container. So it was not the same as a shipping container. It may look like it, but the dimensions were all different and it was suited for you know, a habitable space as opposed to shipping bicycles and bananas and things like that. So, it, and, and from there, you know, we reached the plateau with that module and what the cargo container could do and then created our own steel frame. Okay, now we're working on a light gauge uh, metal uh, frame and, and the possibilities are endless. We're, we're talking about doing you know, 12 story and 30 story buildings now. Right, where all of this started in its infancy as a, a single family home. Uh, and, and that happens in the world of many different disciplines. You look in the music industry, there's usually a local band that kind of draws all their inspiration locally and they grow larger and larger. And before you know, they're right. the international sensation, right? Because people can, can uh, align with it. So it's no, no different than that. But we've been really fortunate. I, I've been really lucky to surround myself with some people who are just incredible. And it's not stopping. And it's happening back now as well. Well, and, and it's not stopping and it's growing. It's growing rather quickly. Can you still see uh, me on your screen, Peter? Do it one more time. I'm sorry. Can, can you can you still see me on your computer screen right now? Yeah, I see you. Maybe Perfect. folks don't see me. That's OK. Let's why don't we jump to your presentation? OK. Yeah. So here we go. We're on slide one. What are we looking at here? All right. Well, essentially, being in Los Angeles is a. Um, I mean, if you're not aware of the homeless situation, it, it, it happens very quickly here. It, it comes upon you very quickly as you're driving around in the car. And it, once we started creating buildings that I thought were more affordable, better quality on time, I said, there's gotta be a solution for this homeless challenge. And, um, and when you look at the homeless in LA, I think we have around 50 or 60,000. But when you look at the bigger picture around the planet, I think we have 1.6 billion people, 1.8 billion people who don't have adequate housing. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I, I, I've gone camping a few times and slept outside without the tent and it's rough. And you're in Los Angeles, you see people sleeping on a sidewalk 
And you, you realize how quickly what you've unveiled and what you've been working on can help so many different people. Right. Uh, so at that point, you almost have this moral obligation to share this and, and try to find some solutions for, the, for not just Los Angeles, but across the nation and, and, and across the planet, if you can. So I, I think too often, and you're hearing it, it sounds like I have an ax to grind with, with architects, and I really don't, but I, knowing what I know and, and also what other architects know, how they cannot address this challenge in society is beyond me. That, that's right. kind of shocking because they, they have a skill set that is that's unbelievable. But is it being focused in, in this direction? Uh, probably not. There are very few architects who are really tackling this challenge. Thank you. Yes. So here we're going to have some fun with these slides. Uh, this is the precursor to a, a homeless project that we did in Los Angeles. And uh, prior to us walking in on the job, I think 12 or 15,000 people showed up in protest of this modular, or this, yeah, well, not, it was a modular, a uh, homeless shelter in Koreatown in Los Angeles. Now, everyone votes for these things when they have the local election, but never do they want to see it in their, you know, in their neighborhood. So we got the call after the protest took place, of course, and we had to go in and try to help people out with this. And, and it, was, it was a collaborative effort that took place. You know, you're working with the council members, working with people in the community, and it's just good old communication. Right. And so what happened is we, we put together this, this project, which was based with those uh, previous modules that I described to you. There were modified mod, uh, cargo containers out of, out of China. And we ended up with a, um, an 84 uh, bed homeless shelter. And, uh, and everyone's pretty happy with it now. Right. Not far from where you see this gathering uh, is, is where the project is located. It's on Wilshire Boulevard. And um, the project's been there. There are no complaints at all. Everyone loves it, you know, but prior to that, people are scared of the unknown. And right. I get that. But the more projects that are done that are that are successful, I think the more uh, folks will be, um, you know, receptive to, to the idea in general and then to the actual buildings themselves. So, yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. And I think that's part of it, yeah. right? There's the understanding of what it is you're building. And then there's the not understanding of what it is you're building. Uh, but once it was built and how beautiful it was, people people start to, you know, they start to buy into it and they start to get it. And then they have the aha moment. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Got it. You know, go and jump to, yeah, and jump to the next slide. You start to see that project and um, it, it, it's a pretty good sized project. It took over yeah. a county park in the middle of Los Angeles. Um, on the right side is where all the housing units are. But the entire thing is grouped around a communal courtyard. Uh, one of the challenges of creating these these uh, homeless shelters is not just to plug people into a box somewhere. We can do that. We can put up tents tomorrow. That's done everywhere. But you're trying to get these people who are, hit some impasse in their life where things have gone, you know, unfortunately bad. You want to get them back on their feet and reinserted into society as productive members. So it's got to be more than just the housing. So the architects who say, well, I just do the building, I think are copping out. You know, you have to get together with the policymakers, with the uh, folks who are what we call the uh, the service providers um, that enable these people not only to sleep inside at night, but to you know learn how to put together a resume, right. learn how to go into school, learn how to really bring some value back to their lives so they can go out and be independent. Uh, so it, it's a, it's a kind of a very collaborative uh, effort when it comes to uh, putting all these together. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see. I have, um, <clears throat> there were, the project is built uh, in the, much in the way that modular projects are done. You know, the foundation is laid in, the, the modules are brought in, we can go to the yeah. next one, and, and you'll start to see that it, it, it all comes together, right? And this is that communal courtyard. The same modules that were used for the building are used for these little outdoor uh, pavilions and, and outdoor eating area. Um, so it, it doesn't mean if you're working in modular that everything has to look like a minimum security prison, you know, and you, right. this is where the architects come in and you have to create these humane spaces. Um, and I think, take, I think you go to the next slide. There's one more in there that's really important. And you'll see these folks that we have images. They're almost eight feet tall above each door. And those are the local heroes in the neighborhood that no one has ever heard of. Right. And, 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 and so many people ask me, why are you doing that? Right. I said, well, I think we need to celebrate the people who make a difference every day. 
but they are not on the news every night. But these are the people who take care of your neighborhood, make sure your kid gets home safe walking down the street. I have one guy that just sweeps the sidewalk in the city block. He doesn't own the city block, but he just cares, right? And for the people who are living in the homeless shelter, that's accessible. That's something that they can reach. And, and I give the example of putting a picture of Beyonce, and I love Beyonce, or Beyonce, or, or Magic Johnson, and all these folks that we aspire to be like they're pros, but for those folks yeah. who are homeless, that's so unattainable. It's so far distant. It's almost like I'll never get there. But these folks, when they start to understand who they are, or even inquire about them, they said, I can do that. I can sweep the street. I can get a little job. I can help people in a shelter. That gives you that motivation or that, that, that first step of recovery. You know? So we integrate that into the architecture. We don't just talk about it as a nice story on, the, on your, 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 your show here. I'm really happy we have a forum to do that, but it's incumbent upon us to put this out there and make it part of the solution because the solution is not purely an architectural solution. Yeah. Well, you know, let me, uh, I would add something to this if I could, Peter, and welcome back to the screen, by the way. Good to have mm -hmm. you on this. You know, when, when you talk about the collaboration, you talk about dealing with the city, the, you know, public officials, the politicians, just watching uh, what you were just, you know, watching the pictures you put up there and showing the local heroes that nobody ever hears about other than, the person they're helping, right? Or the people they're helping in the community. But celebrating them is also a powerful tool when you're going to talk to the local politicians and the government when you're trying to do a project and do a good project, say, but we're also going to celebrate the people in that community. That gives them reason to want to even do it. Mm -hmm. Like when you really think about it, from a political standpoint, from a public official standpoint, you know, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, it is people are there and they, you know, they're they want votes. Well, guess what? That becomes a win win as an architect like yourself or a developer. If you can take say, hey, listen, we're going to celebrate the local people as well as do a great project for the community. It's a win win for everybody. And that's kind of what you're talking about. Yes. It's spot on, Dave. You're right on. We work with Councilman Herb Wesson uh, in the yeah. Koreatown district and we couldn't do it without it. You know, the, these folks are voted into office. And traditionally, when you're doing affordable housing or, or right. homeless housing, politicians dread it. Why? Yeah. Because it looks really nice in the first year and everyone's taking a photograph. But three years or four years later, it's heading downhill. I grew up in New Jersey. There were brick, you know, projects. They lasted 30 years and they tore them down. Right. Just right. imploded them, tore them down. Right? So from a long-term standpoint, they're, they're nightmare projects, right? Unless somebody gives it the attention that it needs. It's not just about putting people into a box and say, okay, we're done. We took care of the problem. You didn't create, you, you just shifted the problem. Right, so, right. you know, yeah, the policymakers are, are critical to the whole thing. I'm not ready to go into politics, but I do understand, uh, you know, how they can be instrumental and accelerate what we're talking about. You know, government, Governor Newsom, as much as I, you know, he drives me a little bit nutty. There, there are some mandates taking place at statewide level that are encouraging. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, we got uh, Peter. So, it, it, yeah, so that combination is critical. You 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 reached on, you hit on something really important there. Yeah, it, it definitely is. Uh, definitely is useful. All right, I'm going to put your slides back up. Let's keep going. Okay. Um, yeah, so if we go to the next slide, you'll be able to see uh, this is the final, this is the tower right on Wilshire Boulevard that we created uh, with the, the founding owner, Max Azria, who was the one I mentioned earlier, who had passed away while the project was, uh, was under construction. But this now commemorates him. You know, his, his quote was, we want to create a home for everyone on the planet. Uh, and and he was able to execute this project and a few others uh, that, that, that were built uh, right about when he passed away. So we, we have like a little legacy with with him and, and um, you know, have to recognize him because so much of what I'm doing today ties right back to the opportunities that he gave yeah. me, you know, about five, six years ago. So we go to the next slide, um, you'll start to see uh, that this is, um, when I get into the modular circle or modular discussion, uh, there's so many people who want me to go in and start fighting for it and saying, you know, it's so much better than traditional construction for all these different reasons. And you can talk all day long, but people have been building Traditionally, in the same way, really, for the last thousand years, it really has not changed all that much. Um, so how do you fight that? 
you know, you, you can't argue about it. You, the proof's in the pudding. You start to build things and you start to create them and, and then people will evaluate it. And, and if it's strong enough, you don't have to defend it. It will defend itself. So this little quote from Buckminster Fuller, who I was fortunate enough to meet when I was a young guy in college, um, th this explained the entire thing where it says, just create something that's gonna make the original model obsolete. And we've all been through this. I mean, I, everyone I think that had a cell phone 20 years ago that was looked like a World War II walkie talkie, right, is now carrying around this little smartphone. And um, th there was, it was an easy sell. You say, okay, I don't, I don't need that old big clunky thing. I need this smaller thing. It's, it's, it's a lot easier to work with. And, um, and no one fought against the old, the old style phone. So it, it, yeah. it transcends just about every industry. And, um, and, and I like to quote it because in many ways, Bucky Fuller inspired me as a young man when I was in undergraduate school. I was fortunate enough to meet him. Um, and he was this environmentalist, forward thinking engineer, almost a Renaissance man back in the 30s. You know, yeah. and, uh, and he, he was recognized and half the folks that that did, you know, recognize him, thought he was this kooky, mad scientist. Right. And others said, no, this guy's a genius. You know, he was responsible for creating you know, the invention of the space frame um, and geodesic domes that you're seeing right now. Um, he's the, the one who really had the ideas for the biosphere uh, where folks really started to look at what's it going to be like to just live off the land instead of, you know, relying, be relying upon fossil fuels and all that. So it was very forward thinking from an environmental standpoint and also from a mankind standpoint. He was interested in doing what was best for mankind. He was not there just to say, I want to be a scientist for the sake of being a scientist. So after, after this slide, you'll start to see that um, his, his kind of mantra and everything he was talking about um, uh, I started to really look closely at it. And you see an image now that's about family and, and friends. And, and this is what it all boils down to for me. And um, we uh, just about all the decisions I make uh, are based in this. Now, uh, we talk about a, a triple bottom line culture, right? Where we're interested in helping mankind. We're interested in sustainability or what I call thriveability. We don't want to just sustain. We want to thrive when it comes to the planet and environmentally mm -hmm. conscious issues. And then profitability, because if I cannot stay in business, I can't take care of my family. I can't take care of the planet. It, it's a struggle, you know. So those three things are really important to us. But this family focus is the one that's most important, I, I think, for me. Coming from an Italian-American family, it's kind of hammered in your head, you know, from a young age. And, and you, you go through all these rituals and traditions. And, and then you get older and say, man, this stuff was really cool. And, and you want to hold on to it, you know, because it fosters that, that, you know, that closeness that we need. If, we, if you go to the next slide, you're going to start to see that when I grew up and, and um, really post-World War II, there was this American dream that I was not even aware of when I was a kid. You know, when you came back after World War II, there was the GI Bill that enabled you to get an affordable loan. You could build your house. And, and, and that was kind of the American dream. You have your own house and you're able to sustain your family. Well, I had no clue about that until I met people who were coming to the US from other countries. And they said, we can't buy a home where we live. It was either not allowed, there was no way we we're going to afford it, or it was a pipe dream. I'd have to work for 200 years to get it. But I can do that in the USA. And you'll find people from Europe, South America, wherever it is, Cuba, who come here and say, this is the American dream, and I'm gonna be able to have a house for my family. Okay, so that whole thing back in the 50s and 60s um, came to fruition. But along the way, what people didn't really pay attention to, right, unless you watched the Tom Hanks movie, which is Money Pit, is that you have to maintain this place and you have to pay for it and, and you invest all your money in it. And then maybe if you sell it before you pass away, you'll reap the benefit of all the money that you pump into this place, right? Um, uh, but often that didn't happen. It was kind of passed on to the next generation and that's okay. But all that's changing now. And, and I'd like to refer to this as, you know, a shift or a disruption in the American dream. And I think there's a new one. So you go to the next slide, you'll see that the way that uh, projects are being designed and built now uh, are taking into consideration, not just, hey, I got to provide for my family with this house and shelter them. But now a home is being viewed as an opportunity in the business world. Okay, so you can create an income generating property from your home. This is a project we worked on down in Austin, Texas, and that's an ADU. If you go to the next slide, 
you'll see the house itself, and then you're gonna see the floor plan. Now, the important part of this is in the floor plan, yeah, and you'll see that red line, a demising line there that separates the master suite and the great room from the secondary bedrooms. Well, with the introduction of ADU laws from the policymakers in California, yeah. what you're finding more in, in a more prevalent manner is not only are people taking original homes and adding an ADU as an income property, but architects now, including ourselves, are designing homes that can be easily separated so a half of the home could be rented out as an Airbnb, right? It can be an income generating property. So these empty nesters don't have to leave. They don't have to move out because they can't afford to be there anymore. So this is changing the way people think about the American home. And, and most, I mean, the, the young fellows, young folks in, uh, in college right now are constantly thinking about how can my home produce income for me? That, that never existed in the 60s and 70s. It's like, what? You don't make money with your house. Now, don't get me wrong. In that Italian American neighborhood, these Italians that came over from Italy who didn't get through elementary school, okay? You see, their education was just not there. Yeah. They were really smart. Since the Romans, okay, there were these buildings called insulae where they were multifamily buildings. And what would happen is a family would live in one of the units and they ran out the duplex or the triplex or whatever it was. This business model has been around for 2000 years. This is what those Italian Americans would do when they moved into our neighborhood, right? And it kind of disappeared for a while. And now it's coming full circle and I'm saying, wow, these people had it down so long ago. So in here you see a modern building being designed with this mm -hmm. idea of generating income for the family or whoever it might be so that they have some level of stability there. In California, this is exactly why the ADU laws came about. And you go to the next slide here. Okay, now you're gonna start, see this is ADUs. I was um, CEO at a company called Steelblocks. And Steelblocks focuses on accessory dwelling units for the folks who are outside of California. And essentially the state of California said, we will allow you to place this granny flat, uh, also known as an accessory dwelling unit in your backyard. And you don't need any additional parking. It can be up to 1200 square feet. And for most of us say, well, why do I want someone living in the backyard? Well, because it's so expensive here, you need to generate income with that property. So this, the, the ADU laws have, have been around now for about, I think five or six years, but it's not until the state really uh, prevented the local jurisdictions from finding loopholes where they didn't have to develop because um, in many neighborhoods, people don't want this. Right. right. They're sitting there going, I don't want another family living in the backyard. So essentially, the state of California has eliminated a single family zone because everyone can place one of these on their property. So there is resistance no matter where you go. But th this is one instance where the policymakers were really, really helpful on this. And it also increases density. It brings people back into the city. Uh, we don't drive two and a half hours now because there's no affordable space. And uh, uh, it, it solves many different challenges. Now, along with that, there are these wonderful little apps. You know, you pick up your phone, and you're like, hey, Airbnb, you're automatically a landlord. It's set up so easily for you to do this that you think, wow, this just makes sense. So policymakers, technology, the spirit of, you know, global kind of resources, are all the moons are all aligning for modular, and the ADUs are a very accessible um, example of that. Uh, so it's going to take some time for people to, to acclimate to it. Uh, I think I, 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 I saw, I'm, I'm not sure if you have seen it, but there was a movie um, about Roy Kroc and, and McDonald's. And in that movie, there's this theme where Roy Kroc, who's played by Michael Keaton, he goes to the McDonald's hamburger stand that had closed down and then opened back up, uh, up in Monrovia here in California. And he goes up, he's standing in line, and he goes up to the window, and they, he says, I have a cheeseburger and the fries and the, and the soda. He pays them, and the guy turns around, and he puts his bag on the counter. And he says, what's this? He goes, that's your food. He goes, no, you don't understand. I just ordered. He goes, yeah, that's your food. And Michael Keaton pauses and goes, that's my food. He goes, yeah. He goes, uh, is it done? He goes, yes, it's done. He goes, what do I do? He says, you take it. He goes, where do I eat it? You see, eat it in your car, eat it anywhere you like, go to the park and enjoy yourself. So what happened in this one moment, people were used to eating a burger in a restaurant or a diner, and it took just as long to get it as it would a steak. Yeah. Right? And all the folks at McDonald's did was they changed the delivery of that. And this guy has this aha moment 
and goes, wow. And from there, you know, he turned McDonald's into this empire. But the same thing is happening in the world of modular. People are familiar with the traditional way in which things have been done for centuries and centuries. And, and you know, if something's not broken, don't fix it, right? There's the old mantra. But I think there is this consensus across the planet that it's broken, okay? And we do need to fix this thing somehow. So rather than going to attack it, much like what Bucky Fuller says, um, we're gonna create an alternative and it will speak for itself. So that's where we are. And I think the ADUs start to make this stuff accessible to the everyday person who really is not concerned about, um, you know, are you doing it modular or traditional, right? And, and, and even I, I pick up my phone, I really don't care how they put this phone together so long as it works for me, you know? So I, I think that that's what starts to happen. And now you're starting to see, uh, we, these kind of principles apply not just in the residential world, they apply in the commercial world as well. So it, if it just makes sense, you're going to find many people adopting these different, um, different methodologies. So, and, and, and much of this is driven by, I mean, you can stay in the ADU world. And I think if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, there's a level of customization that takes place, right? And, and I think people uh, envision uh, modular as a single wide trailer or a double wide trailer. And, and, and those are really, I guess the redeeming quality of those buildings is not so high on the food chain, right? And people get upset with it. But once you understand how these systems work, then the flexibility becomes unleashed, right? It's just that everyone wants to make sure, hey, my building shouldn't leak. I don't care how good it looks, right? It, it, you have to satisfy all these essentials. Right. If, if Frank Lloyd Wright was here, he'd tell you different. He'd say, listen, all great architecture leaks, okay? And that's good, good for him. But you know, we end up in these liability ch challenges that are just yeah. not great for architects. And, and also going back to my original point about the architects, that's one of the reasons why architects don't go down this path, right? It, it's just too much at risk and, um, and it's all new technology, it's data driven. And, and in some ways uh, we're redefining what an architect does, because it's more manufacturing. You have to learn the processes of manufacturing, cultivating data, and all of this feeds a design palette that's expanded and it does some really wonderful things. So let's head to the next slide. And now you're starting to see some of the work from steel blocks and really attractive uh, ADU projects uh, that are delivered across the United States. And all of this is happening at, at the ADU level. And, and folks will ask me, Peter, how do you go from designing ADU projects, which are, you know, the maximum 1,200 square feet, but most of them are about five or 600 square feet, to doing multifamily, multi-story, mid-rise and high-rise building. <coughs> and the, um, the jump is not that great. And the production and the construction world, people say, wait a minute, you're doing a one-story building versus a 12 or 50-story building? Yes, but the modular units, the apartments, are approximately the same size. So at that point, you're trying to understand, okay, how do I stack these up structurally so it's going to be able to withstand an earthquake and lateral forces? How do I put it all together so it's complying with all the fire codes so that it's safe and I'm not creating a fire trap? And then how do I create something that is uh, makes great business sense so that when I do this, I can actually stay in business? And then the ultimate goal in all of it is, um, is it a place that is going to contribute to the quality of life for the people who utilize it and experience it, right? That's at the end of it all. So first you have to figure out how it all works and then say, okay, now we need to satisfy the most important thing, okay? So, um, so it gets a little bit more complex. And I think in architecture school, all too often uh, we're, we're taught, let's give the client what they need, show them maybe some alternative ways of doing things, maybe a better way to do it. But... Um, Unfortunately, out in the profession, it, it doesn't get too far down the line where folks are saying, I really want to make a difference in this neighborhood. It becomes more of an economical uh, challenge. And they do a great, don't get me wrong, they do a great job, but there's so much more that can be done. And now the modular thing, modular is just a way for us to get closer to it. Okay, because I think so many of these architects, in all fairness to them, they are saddled with liability, all the challenges of change orders, blown schedules, and clients are just like, wait a minute, we did not anticipate this. Because traditionally, historically, construction is a non-predictable a non process. And modular introduces predictability to it. 
across the board, from the planning to the fabrication to the construction. So I know I get kind of on my soapbox about that, but um, I believe in it. I, I think that um, it, it got, we're in our infancy right now. There's some great things ahead for us. Well, you know, we should, we, 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 it's a shame we're in our infancy because we shouldn't still have uh, field verify on our plans, right? We're so much more advanced than that and everything that we do. And my good friend, I say it all the time on the show, Jerry McCaughey always says that the greatest builders in the world, you know, in the universe is NASA. Yeah. You know, they don't, they don't get it. They don't take that big uh, space station part uh, all the way up into outer space and then put on their spacesuits and go walk out and out into the danger. And then all of a sudden they look at their plans and it says field verified and make sure the darn thing fits, you know, that's kind sure. of where we're at though. When we're finally starting to incorporate some of those same principles and practices into regular site construction. So to no. me, you know, to me, we shouldn't be living in a world of change orders any longer unless somebody creates that change order other than ground. We don't know what's in the ground. Right. We don't know if Jimmy Hoff is buried on that piece of property. You never know. Right. Those, yeah. are, those are the, those are the uh, what ifs. But anything I think above the ground, we should have control over these days. Uh, we yeah. have the technology to do it. All right. I'm off my soapbox. Back to you. OK, cool. So let's move on to. Um, yeah. Now you're starting to see an ADU project that. Uh, steel blocks uh, yep. put up in Coachella, you know, and where folks come in and sign in and they've got these cool little casitas out in the desert. And, and what happens in, in the modular world, because we're in our, I call it our infancy, even though people have been, you know, at this for about 100 years um, and probably even longer, I can point to things, you know, that, that would really you know, show that this is not a, a, a new concept. Um, yep. The... When you come up with these solutions, we're, we have a limited view of the world. We see as we are, right? We see the application of what we're doing to the challenges that we're addressing. And then these folks walk in out of left field and they're not architects, they're not, anybody has anything to do with construction and they go, I can use that to solve this other problem. And you've never seen it as the architect. So you've got this solution. It's not in search of a problem, but people find problems to. To, you know, right. to satisfy, to, to, to solve with the technology. And, and so now all of a sudden, and, and this is where a wonderful idea blossoms. This is when you know you've got something incredible because you intended to do one thing and everybody comes in and gets a hold of it. And before you know it, exponentially, it's, it's being applied across the board and you're going, what's going on here? This is not what I intended, but it's all good, man, right? So you roll with it. And, and, and this happened with the cargo container projects because up until we did that project in Redondo Beach, no one had solved that Rubik's Cube of getting to the National Building Code with it. But I was able to do that. And the minute that happened, all of a sudden, these cargo containers are hanging from trees everywhere. Everybody was working on this project. <laughs> and even to this day, whenever one is done, there's a local article about it because it's so new and revolutionary. And they always cite my name in it. You know, it's on Wikipedia, whatever. And said, all right, Peter DiMaria did the first cargo container project in the United States. And, and all of a sudden, my phone starts ringing. and get all these emails, right? And, and I find out they're using it, you know, to grow marijuana or they're using it as a casita somewhere or they're using it as a, a five story retail center. So people really apply, you know, their, their ingenuity and, and their creativity to all of it. And um, it's exciting, you know, and, and the same thing is happening now as we're moving this modular space and doing things that are multifamily. Uh, uh, I know it will blossom beyond all of our imaginations. And, and we're still in the early stages. You know, the next generation that gets a hold of this, I mean, we, right now, we are those old phones that were like walkie talkies. You know, give us about 20, 30 years and it's going to, it will really take off. <laughs> I bet. Let's go to the next slide. I'm having fun. All right, so here's an exterior view of one of those ADUs. And they don't have to look like, you know, a tough shed in your backyard from Home Depot. Yeah. They're really elegant and beautiful. Let's go to the next slide. I want a studio that looks like that. Yeah, here's another. Now we're moving to single family homes. This is a, a single family residence. It's 1,440 square feet. Uh, and it's, it purposely strives not to look like something modular, not to look like a double, double uh, you know, wide trailer uh, to, right. to destroy the stigma that goes along with all those. And the first question people ask, is the ceiling going to be too low? Is it going to be claustrophobic? Am I going to have little windows? Is it going to stand up in an earthquake? All, all these things, and you go, well, wait a minute, where have you been? You know, but it's true. I mean, you drive to some parts of the country, and all fairness to these folks, the buildings are falling down. 
and they, they just not, they don't withstand the test of time. So you'll see us working in steel, not in wood. The wood had many challenges, but I'm not gonna fight with the people in the wood industry, you know? I just know that our buildings don't get eaten by termites. There's no mold, it's superior in terms of strength, no matter where we place it, and the steel's recyclable, you know? And, and so it has all these great environmental attributes, but also someone's getting a building that they can hand out to the next generation and the generation after that. It's more of a long-term outlook by selecting that material. So here, and here you'll see floor to ceiling glass, flat ceilings. I mean, it looks like it's straight out of Miami. Beautiful, beautiful little place. Let's go to the next slide. All right, here's the interior of the, the same building. Okay, open, wide open space, great rooms, all those things that we find in every other type of home that's really important. Families want the kitchen, the, the family room, the dining room, all to be together so people spend time together, right? Let's go to the next slide. And this is an early attempt to do in multifamily. And we did this project in Venice Beach. This is back when this is straight up cargo container project, I'm sitting over a, a concrete podium. And, and, and this is where you get projects like that built in the early stages of development. You know, you, you're considered this crazy architect from LA. The only place you're gonna get something built is in Venice Beach where things, it's kind of anything goes there, right? But this planted the seed and really was a case study for how those projects can come together. We got there and put it all in a place. It's been in place for over 10 years now. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so then when I went with HBG and Max, I was really, Max said, listen, I love what you're doing. How can we take it to the next level? So then we went off to China and I had at my access to 400,000 square feet and 2,000 workers to do whatever I wanted. So we created a, a hybrid container that was now created for, uh, to be a habitable structure. And this project was supposed to go up in Hollywood. But what happened was, developers came to see us and we had a single family home and I didn't know why they were there, but they said, you know, how high can you stack this? They said, I think we we'll go up at least four or five stories. That's the way we designed it. You know, we had a single family residence like the one you saw in the previous slides. And I think within 30 days, they came back and there was a $30 million contract to do this 84 unit apartment building in Los Angeles, right? So once again, you put out the single family residential solution and you've now attracted people who see it in a much different light. And so if you keep going, I think we're gonna to start to see some of those projects. This is the early rendering for this project. It's called Hope on Alvarado. If you go to the next one, that's the real deal. That's it, all around the courtyard, center, uh, wow. part that's T. Cute. And um, it is uh, composed of, I think, 170 modules. And I spent time in China going back and forth. This project was brought over from China. And that was a challenge because the state of California and housing community development, they, they're the ones who certify and license all the factories and fabricators. And it had never been done before. And sometimes we don't have anybody certified or licensed in China. So I had to figure all that out and made it happen. I had a great team with me, Danny Moiselle, Damon Summers, Max, John Jackson. We had a great team of people. We put all this stuff together. And no one believed it was going to happen. I would talk to people and like, yeah, 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 this Di Maria with a kooky idea. Well, sure enough, it came in and, and collaboration. I mean, this was like a military drill, the way it went in. But it, it, it turned out wonderfully. That building's all uh, habited now. And, and unfortunately, Max passed away. And at that point, the company kind of lost its direction. And, um, but we had already designed three other buildings, Hope on uh, Broadway, Hope on Echo Park, excuse me, Hope on... Um, Hyde Park um, and Hope on Avalon, a, a bunch of them. So they took the same technology and gave birth to these other you know, buildings or 100 plus units in each one of the buildings. So at that point we realized we've got something here. This works at a larger scale, but yeah. we're still approaching it as we didn't step completely or go in head first in the modular world because the modular world requires that you are a manufacturer more than anything else, okay? And um, there's no such thing as, and architects are notorious for writing on their drawings to be determined in field. That doesn't happen because things do not leave the factory unless they're already determined, right? So this level of control there, and I'm not a control nut, I'm this easygoing guy, but I understand what happens on the construction site when you don't exhibit that control. 
So from here, I said, okay, we need to do some other things. So I, I went over and worked with the people at Steel Blocks. Steel Blocks helped them get across the finishing line and getting all of their units approved by the state of California. Steel Blocks is focusing in um, ADUs and single family residential and some cool custom commercial project. Now, and, and, and thanks to guys like you, uh, Ben Hershey, Macho Building Institute, you know, the guys that invited me to dinner uh, when we were at the World of Modular event, and I'm meeting incredible people. And one of those people, Diego Rivera, Diego was with um, Superior Wall Systems. He and I get together. I, I think it was like five days straight hanging out with this guy. And I'm like, we can do something. So now we've created this company called Midrise Modular that's going to focus on, you know, this sector of the world, moving up to 12 stories in height, if not into the high rise level as well. Mm -hmm. Because I, like those Romans, I think that's the only way we're going to solve the affordable housing challenge. And, and getting people up the street. I don't see on a lot of land in Los Angeles, you put a single family home, that it's gonna have much impact. Then take care of one family. On that same lot, if I could put a 12 story building, guess what? I got 12 families there on the same plot of land. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so we see some great promise in what's going, what's going on. You can go to the next slide, let's see what we have here. Yeah, so yeah, see mineralized modular and then um, the contact information for steel blocks. And then in the top left corner, I've got the shameless plug for my son. You know, when you're an architect, you, you kind of, through osmosis, your, your knowledge of the architectural world, um, which is basically, you, you can't stop talking about architecture, penetrates your kids, right? And, and my son, Michelangelo, just graduated from the University of Texas, he and I got involved in creating a website where he said, Dad, there's some incredible ideas you have here. Why don't we try to package this and help the industry and do something? Because it's all about communicating, um, you know, what's taking place because so many people don't know about it. So he created this website. You go there and he's really trying to do a service to the industry. And then um, and, and when I go back and look at and say, why is all this happening now? And why was it not happening in 2004, right? Or, or 2005, when I first started, I said, all this stuff is so obvious. It's because we didn't have ambassadors out there like you. You know, I sit down with you, I go on your YouTube channel, you're around the globe. You know, and yep. I can tell you in 2004, 2005, it was the loneliest place on the planet. You know, you sit there, people get excited by it, right? You say, okay, you're doing a container project that's really cool, it's exciting, and then they all go home, right? And then you have to figure out how it works. Right? And for all those people who are excited for you, there's about a hundred others who's like, you're out of your mind, it's never gonna happen, forget it. And they'll give you a million reasons why it won't work. Right? So it's like anything else where you're facing adversity and there's a level of persistence and, and you, if you believe in something, you pursue it. Well, when you wake up in the morning and it's 2023 and you have folks like yourself, um, and, and, and I run into Diego at this Modular Building Institute event, I'm like, man, I'm not alone. There's some other people who are not only solving my challenges, but even the problems I've not been able to address yet. So that's where the collaboration in this field, I think, is critical, right? In the traditional construction world, the contractors sit in the room, they're like, oh, hi, how you doing? But they want to strangle each other, right? Because they're competition with each other. And they're really not learning anything from each right. other. They just want the job. Where in the modular space, I mean, there's some genuine people out there who, who really want to help. And, yeah. and, and that's why what you're doing now is just help, you know, it, it, it's building upon that. So I think the entire industry is indebted to what you're doing in uh, Nolan Brown. Same, same deal. You know, these people really want to help. Uh, ah, you've got a good, good slide up there. And uh, this is a great one, right? Because this transcends architecture, modular and everything else. But when I mentioned earlier that we, we really focus on, you know, the end user, um, the quote, people are meant to be loved and things are meant to be used, um, really refers to sometimes we get caught up in the material world. And I'm not here to give a big sermon on that or anything, but I can tell you in the world of architecture, we work with materials, right? And if you have gold leaf on the wall as opposed to vinyl, you know, there's a difference. It's interpreted differently. Um, if you live in the Taj Mahal as opposed to a mud hut, it's interpreted differently, okay? Right. But those materials sometimes uh, exude status, class, whatever it might be. And I'm not saying everyone should live in a mud hut. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying though is it's important for us not to get too wrapped up in the architecture and the design. 
You have to do an excellent job, period. It has to be excellent design. I'm not saying compromise it, but stay focused on that end user and who it benefits most because the, the ripple effect is, is unreal. I'll share one, one last thing on that project in Alvarado. I yeah. showed up there one day with, with my son and the security guard walked us through and he said, come on, we'll go up to the top floor. And a young lady just came up to me and she said, who are you? You know, they knew I didn't live there. She said, who are you? I said, well, I'm the guy who's involved with, you know, designing this building. This woman almost started crying. And she said, I've never lived in a place like this before. I'm so thankful to you. This is, the, she had to be living on the street for quite some time. Sure. And all that has to happen is just once. Just once and your entire kind of value system gets slammed and it's a, it's an awakening. And, and then you wake up the next day and say, damn, this makes a difference. This is really cool. And then you start to attract other people with the same mindset and you go, this is great, man. We're on a mission. Let's do this, right? We have the tool set, we have the skills, and now we have those people like we didn't have in 2005. And if you do anything less than that, then you're just compromising. You know, the big guy gave you something, use it. Make, make, you know, do something great with it. Absolutely. You know, Peter, that was an awesome presentation. And you know what? You can see that you have so much passion in all this. And, and you can just hear it in your voice. It's fun and exciting. And, you know, and you meet people, like you said, like Diego and, and uh, you know, Ben Hershey and all these other people that you mentioned, you know. And we meet these people because we go on a journey, right, together. Mm -hmm. I mean, live in houses, but we really live on this planet together. And I think that. Uh, that's a that's a pretty big deal. So I think um, I think right there. I mean, that's that's where we're going to end the show. I think today exactly what you said, you know, do something great. with it. That's that's the best quote I've heard in a long time. Beautiful. So. Dave, I can't thank you enough. Really great. And, and I, I have to I have to recommend everybody out there in that modular space. Diego is a guy who is um, he's based in data. He's in the digital world. He's transforming the entire construction industry. And this yeah. is what you need. Just like what Bucky Fuller said, you can't fight it. You have to create a new model that makes the old model obsolete. And eventually, you know, he's, there'll be some disciples of Diego and, and it will be across the industry. So, um, yeah, for sure. I, yeah. So thank you, Dave, so much. I really appreciate it. And um, I look, look forward to seeing you and listening to more of your, your cast. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it as well, Peter. Greg Ugaldi, I had him flashed up there, was with us today. Good to see you, Greg. Of course, Diego Rivera talking about the triple bottom line strategies are the only way out. Create economics, environmental, and social value for the company. Yeah, Diego is uh, wicked smart when it comes to all those fun things. What's happening, Tom Reddy? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for supporting everybody. Joel Hutchins, there's somebody that knows something about parametric design right there. Good to see you, Joel. I don't know, man. Still got the best hair in the industry as far as I'm concerned. And we got Alistair Sawyer. Look at that. We're traveling around the world. Team Prefab could provide an exchange platform of services by various modular tech or material providers would save a lot of time for the newcomers. Alistair. Now, just so you know, Alistair's building big projects here in the United States, all the way from Vietnam as well. So now, uh, now uh, Team Prefab is global. See, the word's out there just like that. Let's all start talking and collaborating together. We'll go places, right? Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I love it. All right, everybody, listen. Don't go anywhere, Peter. You stay right there. But the rest of you out there, guess what we have coming up? Talking about geodomes. Well, we're going to be talking about them this Wednesday. Check out this company. That's right. Boss Cole's going to be on from GeoShip. And those are all individual panels that can be flat-packed and sent, and you can set them up right at your own backyard, wherever you're at. It's kind of cool. Wait till you see the inside of them. You're going to love them. Anywho, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you join us. Be there. Be square, as they say. All right, Peter, that's it, man. We're going to wrap up right here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't go anywhere. The rest of you, we'll see you this Wednesday. Enjoy these words from our next sponsor, and I'll see you this Wednesday. Bye, everybody. What an amazing show. Thank you to all of our sponsors for helping us to continue to bring all of these innovative conversations to all of you out there. Please visit them, see what they have to offer you. And as always, subscribe to the YouTube channel and ring that bell. It would mean the world to us. I'm Dave Cooper. Thanks for watching.